Um, yeah, as Carrie mentioned, I, I do a lot of different wildlife management research and outreach um, from anything from voles and pocket gophers all the way up to horses and anything in between. Sometimes it's damage management, sometimes it's just uh, human wildlife interactions, um, helping people appreciate animals more or just getting information out. Uh, but today, I think we're really going to be talking more about damage management uh, with pocket gophers and bulls. So let's jump into that. <clears throat> I always like to start with a little bit of identification for voles and gophers, mostly because there's a lot of confusion about what these animals are. And because with common names and people coming in from different states, people call these animals different things. And so sometimes I hear that they have gophers in the yard, but it's actually a mouse or there's voles in the yard and it's actually a gopher. So I always start with ID. So here on the left, you can see that we have a vole. And on our right, we have a pocket gopher and they do look kind of the same. They're brown and furry and about six inches long. But if we start looking at some of the features of the animals, we can tell the difference. So with voles on the left, they have larger ears in relationship to their body than pocket gophers on the right. And you can see the pocket gophers ear is fairly tiny, um, almost non-existent uh, compared to its body shape. The vole's nose is gonna be pointier. It's just almost like a mouse without a tail, essentially. So we're gonna have a, a much pointier nose. The pocket gopher spends most of its life underground. It's going to have a more blunt nose with the long whiskers coming out that help it navigate its tunnel systems underground. And you can imagine if you were living underground, you would not want to have a pointy nose bonking into everything. So it's, they have a, a nice blunt nose. Pocket gophers are mostly diggers. They're spending 90% of their lives underground and they have big feet to show for it. I like to tell people they're the moles of the West. So you think about those big, huge feet meant for digging. Whereas voles are very similar to mice and they just have little feet, almost the same size. Front feet and back feet are gonna be the same size. Um, oh, one more thing. Here, um, you can see there's a hand kind of manipulating this pocket gopher. They're called pocket gophers because they have these cheek pouches that are completely lined and they're actually outside of the chewing surface of their mouths. Um, so what they'll do is they'll come out of their burrows, they'll clip the vegetation uh, really close to their burrow, no more than five or six feet. They'll stuff their cheeks full of that and then go underground and eat it. So that's how they get their name, pocket gopher, because of those pouches on the sides of their face. There's eight species of voles in Utah. There won't be a quiz. You don't have to worry about which ones are which. They all kind of do the same thing. The most common in Utah is the long-tailed vole, but we also have sage voles and desert voles and um, meadow voles, et cetera. Again, they all kind of do the same thing and live the same way. They're about four and a half inches long and they're active year round, mostly during the daytime. Pocket gophers, there's only, there are only two species of these in Utah. Again, they're look, they look very same. They do kind of the same thing. Um, and it's just about how, where they're distributed in elevation. So some of them are gonna be more in the valleys and some are gonna be up in the mountains. But again, they're performing the same function, doing the same thing, controlling them the same way. Pocket gophers are a little bit longer than voles, about six inches. These guys are active year round as well, but they are also active during the 24 hour day cycle. So because they're living underground, they're not restricted by daylight hours and, or nighttime hours. They just kind of eat when they want to and they're active when they want to. So no predictable activity pattern there. Both the pocket gophers and the voles are found pretty much where humans are found in Utah. They both like uh, easily diggable soil. The 
Pocket gophers are more restricted by the access to that soil. So you're really going to see them in areas that don't have a lot of clay, that are, don't have tons of rocks. So a little bit more limited distribution, but pretty much found wherever there are humans. And then you can see on the left, the voles all along the Wasatch Front and in all of our valleys, you're gonna have vole activity. They eat kind of the same thing, but they're eating it in different ways. So voles are gonna live on the top of the grounds, running around getting grass seeds, eating the grasses themselves, scraping fungus off of rocks, eating bark in the winter time, which is why we have our huge problems with them the most is in the winter time. And again, they're mostly foraging above ground. Pocket gophers are also gonna eat plants and grasses, shrubs and tree leaves. They're only going to go three to five feet from their burrow to get that above the surface of the ground. Uh, and it's often, they really just like to eat the roots that they come across as they're digging their tunnels and expanding their home range. And any food they get on the outside, they're gonna pull it in to eat. These feeding patterns are important when it comes to managing the voles in the pocket gophers. So we have to do different things based on their feeding patterns. Getting down into the biology of the species, we need to know this because we're gonna use their biology a little bit against them when it comes to managing them. These little guys are sexually mature at three weeks. So essentially there's a new litter being born and being mature every month from May to October. They only have two to six offspring, but again, these offspring are sexually mature every three weeks. Other than breeding and rearing their young, they are solitary. So we're not gonna see them living in hordes like um, house mice or black rats or anything like that. They're, they are solitary animals. Their lifespan is a year. So while they can have more than one litter a year during May to October, they generally are only going to have one because they're usually going to get eaten by something. It just feels like they're having babies all the time because their babies are having babies, et cetera, et cetera. Voles have a very cyclic population because of the fact that they are reproducing and they're coming to sexual maturity so quickly, their populations will easily overshoot the amount of vegetation that's available. And then their populations crash. And then it sort of starts that cycle all over again. So there may be some years where you never see a vole or um, vole activity in your yard is minimal. And then all of a sudden one year, you just feel like there's voles everywhere. And that's why, because the, they have this reproductive cycle that allows for these bursts of populations and then huge population crashes. Pocket gopher populations are more stable. Uh, they're never really at a high density, uh, but one little animal can do a lot of damage, so it may feel like you've got pocket gophers everywhere. They have a slower maturity cycle, so they're sexually mature from three to six months of age. Their breeding season is April-ish, and that's important to remember because we can control them based on their breeding season. So I say ish because it's all about where you're located. They generally become sexually active uh, in like late February, early March, uh, but they burrow and run around different burrows to find their mates. So they actually have, the soil can't be frozen. Um, so they become more sexually active and try to breed more once our soils are, are not frozen, which tends to be April-ish. Similar amount of offspring as the voles from between five to seven offspring, and they all have a one year lifespan. So again, while the pocket gophers can have possibly two litters a year, it's more likely that that adult female will die before she has a chance to have a second litter. The juveniles disperse from their natal burrows at two months. So around July, you may see an increase in pocket gopher activity because the juveniles 
are excavating their own burrows and trying to find new places to live away from their natal burrows. So let's get down to the nitty gritty a little bit here, uh, what you guys are all interested in, and that is the damage and what we're gonna do about that. I think it's really easy to tell the difference between vole and pocket gopher activity. Here you can see three different ways to tell vole activity. Um, on the left here, you'll see a run where the vole has run back and forth in the same place for months and it basically compacts the soil and creates a run that's really easy to see, especially once you harvest your crops or anything like that, you'll just see the runs everywhere. And they have their feces, they just kind of go to the bathroom as they're running and so you'll see these feces drops within that run. If you have fallow areas around your yard or um, your area where, that you're trying to manage, if you were to just kind of get to the surface, the ground level of that vegetation, kind of move it around with your hands a little bit, you'll be able to see these tunnels through the vegetation where the voles have been running around. Their holes just look like um, a one inch hole, one and a half inch hole in the ground. There's no soil around it. It's just a hole that they've excavated. They do have small burrow systems, but nothing like the pocket gopher burrow system. And then what I hear a lot about in urban areas is the damage here on the right-hand side. This is damage that has occurred during the winter. Once the snow fell, the voles just used that snow to create tunnels and ran around on the surface of the ground all winter long, finding vegetation to eat and exploring the area. Once the snow melts, you can see the trails everywhere. So needless to say, once the snow melts in February and March, I get tons of calls about voles in Utah. Okay, so then let's look at the pocket gopher burrows. Pocket gophers are really um, easy to identify. There's this huge pile of dirt with this plug and it, a plug, you, if you just look closely, it's just a faint ring where they plug the hole, their burrow system with some dirt. And the loose soil on top is just the dirt that they have pushed out. And then all of their activity is below ground that, and you can't see it. If you look closely, you can find access holes throughout the tunnel system that don't have this dirt that they'll use to come out and find food and bring that food in or just as an escape route. And then on the left, on the right hand side here, you'll see what we call casings. Very similar to voles, what's going on is the pocket gopher is running above ground when there's snow on the ground and they actually line their tunnels with dirt as insulation. And when the snow melts, you see these, what's left of those lined tunnels. So two very indicative um, evidence of having pocket gophers. They don't need any cover. So pocket gophers can be anywhere where there's tillable soil, regardless of what's on top of the ground. Here's some evidence of pocket gopher damage that you can see. Um, it's two that I've come across recently that surprised me, so I thought I'd bring them up for you guys. This is just a backyard that you might see anywhere in Utah. On the other side of the wall is an ag field that used to be a pivot. They turn the water off and that pivot doesn't run anymore. So the pocket gopher actually just burrowed away and unknowingly to itself burrowed under a brick wall and wound up in this woman's property. And you can see the damage that has been done to the grass here and here's the new pocket gopher activity. The hole in the ground resulted from the pocket gopher eating all the roots of a tree and the tree dying. So she dug it up and discovered the pocket gophers there. Uh, the second example is this is a uh, water delivery system, so a canal. And here you see uh, some fallow fields, and then these are actually hops next to it. 
and they have someone that maintains this canal system and, and traps regularly, but pocket gophers can actually dig six feet an hour. And so during the night sometime, the pocket gopher dug from the fallow field into the canal system. And they've been digging around throughout the canal probably for years, but no one saw it. However, this last time that it happened, it actually compromised the structure of the canal to the point where the, the canal collapsed and flooded the crop, the uh, hops next door. So a lot can be going on underground that you never see with pocket gophers, which makes them a struggle to manage. So let's talk about how do we do this. And I'm going to focus mostly about urban spaces, suburban spaces, places where there are people. I can give a different talk all about agricultural settings, but this is really focused on how do we do this when the pocket gophers are in our backyard or there are people around or there's pets around and we need to be careful. So we've broken it up into lethal options and non-lethal options. And with the lethal options, I'm gonna really focus on trapping and poisoning. There are fumigants available, but I don't know of a fumigant that's safe to use around people or houses or structures. And most of them actually are not labeled and are purposely restrictive for use around any sort of structures or in areas where there are people. The first thing we need to do, because these guys will live below ground, is figure out how many you actually have. And so what I'll do is I'll stamp down all the mounds, I'll fill in all the open holes. And as I do that, I put in pin flags. Maybe you can mark it with a spot of paint and just mark every place that I have found a mound, found an open hole, et cetera. And then I wait a couple of days and go back and any place that's actually active, the gopher will have opened that hole back up or created new holes nearby. And so that's how you can tell where that pocket gopher is. It may look like there's tons of pocket gophers because the casings stay above the ground or because the dirt piles um, have stayed above the ground, but it could just be one pocket gopher that you're dealing with that's causing a lot of damage. Alternately, you have a field of juveniles, then you've got to take care of all six of those juveniles. So this is a really good place to start for pocket gophers. Once you know if you're dealing with one or seven, then you can start to figure out what tools to use. Trapping is a really good tool when you only have a few pocket gophers to deal with or you have a situation that you can control really well. Um, if you're in a situation where you are a resident and you're surrounded by ag fields, trapping may not be your best option because you may be trapping all the time because the pocket gophers are just gonna keep coming from the ag fields. When I decide to trap, I usually use this trap on the right-hand side here called a Maccabee. And I, we've done a lot of field trials and found that the Maccabee trap is, is the most efficient. It's easy to set, it's quick to set, and it actually has a high catch rate for pocket gophers. And the set's gonna look a lot like the left here. You're gonna find the mound and you're gonna find that the plug of the pocket gopher activity. And then you're, you're just gonna move over a little bit and probe down till you find the burrow, the run, dig a hole with your shovel and you're just gonna set the Maccabees like this. These cables or wires are just a quick, easy wire to help you pull the trap back out and also secure the trap so that you don't see a dog running around with a pocket gopher and your Maccabee trap in its mouth. So it's really just there to secure the trap. So hopefully I'm gonna be able to, ooh. There we go, not really sure what happened there. A family vacation um, at a hopefully I'm going to be able to show you this video and then get back to my presentation. See. Nikki, we're not seeing the video, so is it playing on a different screen? Yeah, hold on a sec. Let's, I bet you it is. I think that's what scared me when I was like, oh, what's going on? Um, let me get back to my screen here. 
can you you guys see my you can still see my talk though right yeah we can see your slide Woo. okay that was weird it just came up out of nowhere <laughs> i'm gonna just hopefully fast forward here without actually clicking on it so oh now we can see the video uh individual in a field here it looks like yeah yep yep you can see this now now my my pointer didn't go crazy and i'm i'm still in control phew Okay, so this is Terry Salmon. He worked in California. And this is just real quick to show you um, how to set the trap, but or to probe and find the burrows. I'm gonna skip it because I don't really want to do the whole screen share thing. And it's really only like a 30 second clip. Um, essentially, you can see here that this is the pocket gopher activity. There we go. And, Can you guys uh, see that? So it, it looks to me like the mouse should be right. Yeah, we can, Nikki. Perfect. And you can see that he's just probing with a metal rod. He's just trying to wait for it to give so he can see where the tunnel is. Okay. So in that one, there was a little bit of a give. So uh, then we need to get a shovel and we need to dig that up and find the mouse or the uh, tunnels, and you'll find a tunnel going in both directions. What we have is we have a tunnel, and, and one tunnel is going this way, and one tunnel is going that way. So we have two tunnels. And this is what the tunnel is going to look like once you excavate it. Um, this is back to that residential area um, when we dug down and had got rid of her dead tree. Uh, this is what you'll see. It's about six to eight inches below the soil and it's horizontal to the ground. And you'll want to find both of them because you don't know if the pocket gopher is going towards the wall over here or if the pocket gopher's activity is on the other side going the other way. And so that's why in the video, Terry was pointing out where the tunnels were. And he's like, we have two tunnels because you need to set your traps in both. Okay, let's see if I can switch without doing this, okay. And then we're gonna show you what the set will look like. Be, uh, be captured. Once you put the traps in the tunnel, the one thing would be, uh, be captured. Once you put the See how it's just, traps just slides tunnel, right on in there. The one thing you need to do is you need to exclude the light because if you leave that, open well what happened is the gophers will push soil to close it up because they want to keep their, their system sealed up keep predators out it keeps the humidity and temperature nice okay and so what he's talking about there is we've got this big hole and we just put these two traps in you want to make it look a little bit like there's been a disturbance but not a complete excavation so you're just going to maybe what i normally do is just put the clod of grass or turf back into the hole and just kind of covers it up so that there's not too much of a disturbance there. And if you need more information on that, I can help you with that as well. Moving on, um, if you have more than just a couple pocket gophers or you have something where there's going to be continued pocket gophers coming into your yard or your premise, whether if you're a school system or something like that, then you might wanna try poison baits. With poison baits, there's always a risk to animals and humans, but with pocket gophers, everything's done below ground. So if you use it correctly and follow the labels on the rodenticides, you should be risk-free or nearly risk-free. I would caution that the poisons can often move through soil and water. So if you're on a well system, or um, you're near a riparian area, you want to be really careful with which bait you use and check your labels. Very similar to finding the pocket gopher burrows for trapping, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to look for that plug. That means that there's recent activity. And then you use that probe to find the, that lateral tunnel that's horizontal to the ground. A lot of the probes out there that you can get them at Cow Ranch or IFA um, actually have a device that 
delivers the poison bait system. So you, you just pour in the bait on the top. And once you find that burrow, you rotate a switch and it delivers the appropriate amount of bait below the surface of the ground with no spilling. What you don't want to do is just take a spoon and just kind of chuck it in the holes that you find because the animal may or may not be coming up and down out of that hole, but also because um, dogs or kids might see that, you might spill some of the bait. And again, it's going to be poisonous to any mammal. So you want to be really careful with the way that you put that bait into the ground. If we don't want to use a lethal option, or often I say let's use the non-lethal options in conjunction with lethal options, um, exclusion is a great way. So maybe you're in a, how, in a housing environment or a school system and you just have some trees that you don't want to get eaten. Uh, fencing is a great way to get some exclusion effort done with pocket gophers. It's not gonna be effective for you to fence off your entire yard, nothing like that. This is something where it's very precise. You have precise targets. So usually we get a quarter inch to half inch woven wire mesh and burrow it about 18 inches on the ground. You can see in this diagram, they've just put it around the root ball and then also had it sticking up above the ground. I have some uh, folks right now that are trying an idea of lining their garden beds with the net, the mesh and bring them up six inches up their garden bed walls and seeing if that can exclude the pocket gophers from coming in to eat their carrots or, or other or, um, vegetation. So I have a lot of people always ask me, why do we have the mesh sticking up above the ground if the pocket gophers basically live underground. Well, we have it up above the ground for two reasons. One, pocket gophers can forge above ground when they need extra food or if they're not finding the roots below ground. And two, remember that when it snows, pocket gophers are running above ground underneath that snow and they can get to your plants above ground during that time. So by keeping the mesh up, maybe six inches above the surface of the ground, you're going to be <clears throat> protecting your trees in the wintertime as well. Now you can do something temporary where you're just <clears throat> anything above ground is just temporary during the wintertime and then you can take that away in the spring for visual aesthetics. <clears throat> Some other options are um, al altering your environment. So there's been some research done where if you plant unattractive plants that have shallow roots that don't offer any food, then the pocket gophers won't, will kind of go into that area. They're not finding roots, they're not finding a food base, and then they'll turn around and leave and won't come into your property. <clears throat> I think that could be pretty tricky. And especially if you have a large property, that may not be a possibility, but I just offer it up there as an idea um, because I have seen some information on that. Uh, another thing you could do because they are burrowing animals is if you're developing a plot of land for a small garden or um, for some ex uh, expensive ornamentals, you can actually create a buffer around subsurface, create a buffer of rocks around that so that above ground it looks fine and it's pretty, but below ground, it's some really hard to navigate rocks. Remember, pocket gophers like to be able to till the soil pretty easily. So if they come against a barrier of boulders or three inch wide rocks all over the place, probably not gonna wanna go there anymore, especially if they have other options. So that's one the way you can alter your ground below ground if you have smaller areas to deal with. And then finally, I would be remiss if I didn't mention tolerance. Tolerance is where you don't do anything, where you're saying, okay, well, there's no real damage. It's only one pocket gopher. I'm really busy this year and I just don't care. I'm just gonna let it go. And that's fine. I would say that you then can roll down the tunnels, kind of rake the grass, keep your surface area 
healthy so that the grass can regrow, uh, so that the soil that the pocket gophers are pushing up doesn't damage your grass or crops for the future. Is there a way we can make this bar go away? <clears throat> anyway, um, given all of those tools, the best, the way that you're gonna make that the most successful is to combine them and use the timing. I mean, remember I said, we're gonna use their biology against them a little bit. So the goal is to be proactive, which means that you're going to go out there in the, in the uh, late winter, or early spring, and you're gonna monitor for damage, monitor for activity, and keep looking for that activity, especially late summer when the juveniles are starting to disperse. Choose your method ahead of your problem so that you're not scrambling to figure out what you're going to do once the problem's already there. And then again, use the animal's biology against it. So for example, if you've decided to do lethal control, do this in the spring, uh, like late February to early April when the pocket, gopher, pocket gophers are running around more often and they're exploring more often to try to find mates. They can encounter your traps, they can encounter your poison bait, and you can reduce that population before they start to have offspring. But if you find out that you maybe didn't have pocket gophers in April, like just came over as they dispersed when they were juveniles, make sure you're on point and you know to look for activity in late summer, early fall, and monitor for those juveniles and get the trapping and your poison bait protocol in place before you need it. And then before winter, try to do some retroactive exclusion on your plants that are close to any recent burrow activity. Um, make sure that you have, um, check all your fencing so that if it's if you put down that fencing years ago, let's check to make sure it's still intact that the pocket gophers can't chew their way through, things like that. So you can do a perimeter check, you can go through your property and just make sure what the pocket gopher activity is going into the winter so that you can be prepared. Okay, let's move on to voles. So voles got the kind of the same idea here. There are some repellents, we'll talk about it real quick, but um, there and there's fumigants, but that again, it's not safe for a public environment. So I'm not really focusing on those. The lethal options for voles are gonna be trickier because the voles live above ground. So anything you do can be found by pets and children. So you have to be pretty careful. But trapping is really easy. There's no digging involved. Uh, it, you just basically use a common mouse trap set, like those Victor traps, any kind of snap trap. And you can actually see in this picture here, the snap trap is triggered and there's the vole in the run. You're gonna set the traps. You don't need to bait them. You just set them in that vole run that you've identified close to where you found the, the vole hole. And then you're gonna cover it with a plate or a pan. In the case of this picture, it is just a cereal box that's been rolled down and you fasten it to the ground with either some nails um, or some wire. And then check the traps every few hours because it, these guys are diurnal, they are running around during the day. It doesn't take very long for you to trap those voles. This way, however, is not very safe if you have curious people or pets running around. You can get commercial grade snap traps that are inside of a, a security box, in which case you'll want to find a way to get that security box onto the run or near the run, or maybe just place it into an area of high activity. And you may be able to trap the voles that way in, in a more safer fashion than just having snap traps on the ground. Most people, when they're dealing with lethal control for voles, are going to use poisons. Poison baits are, are pretty common for voles. There's a lot of commercial bait boxes out there. Some of them have locks on them so that you can secure them in areas where there are 
people running about or dogs or babies in investigating the area. You see a lot of these in apartment complexes around the perimeter of stores. Make sure you're using bait that's labeled for voles. It may say meadow voles. It's okay, it doesn't matter what species of vole, just make sure it's labeled for voles. Do not use bait listed for pocket gophers. That's formulated specifically for pocket gophers. It also can be more concentrated and more lethal for pets and humans in the area. Also do not put grain baits in the bait boxes. They are, it's better to use bait blocks like you see in this picture. The reason why I don't want you to put grain baits in the box is because if uh, an animal were to beat that box around or a human were to pick it up, the bait can shake out. And that bait is lethal to all mammals. You're generally going to be using second generation anticoagulants like dipassinone, and they take two or three consumptions before they're lethal. So if a dog were to get into it or a human were to get into it, you have, they're not, it's not like strychnine. They're not gonna die right away, but you will make them really, really sick. So the bait that's formulated for voles keeps in mind that it's going to be above ground and it could be potentially accessed by other mammals. So it's less lethal um, and, tr and trying to be more safe. So use the bait specified. I think I beat that horse, okay. If you don't want to use poisons um, or if you want to use in combination with a non-lethal method, exclusion is pretty easy. Exclusion is really just focused on uh, trees and shrubs, usually in the winter time. This is when voles don't have grasses or flowers or seeds to eat, so they start to peel the bark off of saplings and other trees in the wintertime. So like in this picture, you can use quarter inch mesh. You, want, you don't wanna use half inch mesh because a small vole can squeeze their head through that. So quarter inch mesh, and you sink it below the ground by about six inches and um, just basically make a column tube around the plants that you wanna protect. For larger trees, you can wrap it in um, the tree wrapping that you might you would use for sunburn and such on your orchard trees. You can wrap that and it provides some exclusion as well. Make sure I look at my notes here, okay. You can alter the ground to be less attractive to voles. So that is kind of the nice thing. They want to have that shrubby cover and high grasses for protection from predators. So if you take away that by mowing your grass, removing wood piles, you can keep down the vole population and keep them from wanting to be on your property. Most people will clean the ditches and burn fallow areas so that the voles don't have that shelter. If you have large trees that you're trying to protect, you can mulch two feet around the tree trunks. I would say you can go up to three or four feet around the tree trunks. That will help make the vole feel exposed. And again, that vole will be less likely to meet up with your tree and try to strip the bark from the trunk. Some people have written about using crown vetch as a border plant. So if you have an, just a small area that you are trying to protect, such as a garden, they would suggest planting crown vetch as a border plant around that because the voles are not attracted to that vegetation. I haven't tried it, so I can't vouch for it, but just wanted to throw it out there. So you can see in this photo here, this, owner was very gung-ho about protecting the garden from everything, um, military invasions included, it looks like, but they did a really good job. So I, I wanted to show it to you here. There's no vegetation in the borders. Everything is bare ground or rocks. So a vole would feel extremely exposed moving around here. They've also buried some metal sheeting six inches down to provide a barrier from outside into 
the garden for smaller animals. And then of course they're bigger animals, that's mostly for deer. So you can see how they've cleared the area. They've also an increased exposure and then also created some barriers, um, very big into the exclusion tactics. Again, if you wanna tolerate voles, you can. If you wanna rake over their runs and fertilize the grass, the grass will come back. You wanna be really careful with just using tolerance because again, those voles do have that cyclic population. So it may be that this year there's only a couple voles and you can handle it, it's not that big of a deal. Just be aware that perhaps the next year and definitely the next year after, you are going to have a lot of voles. So you need to have a plan in place if you have expensive shrubbery or orchard trees that you wanna protect from the voles. Again, repellents are an option. So I didn't wanna not bring them up. Thyrum is labeled for use on trees. It is not labeled for use on um, edible plants. My issue with just using repellents is that repellents are generally short term and it's labor intensive. You gotta make sure the repellent gets on all bits of that tree or whatever it is that you're putting the repellent on. And then if, there, if you have an irrigation system, you have to be careful that your lawn sprinklers aren't spraying off your repellent from whatever you just put it on. Um, also under certain temperatures, the repellent will break down and just become inactive. So it, I think it could be really, really useful in very certain situations. So if you have a really expensive tree or a tree that's otherwise vulnerable, that, or maybe, it's, maybe it was injured and is trying to heal, you're trying to really protect it, then that might be an option. But I don't think that it's a broad scale option that you can use all the time in every situation. I would also caution that it may be transferable to the people that touch it. And so if you're in an area where there are small children that are then putting their fingers in their mouths, maybe a repellent is not the way to go. So just like the pocket covers, it comes down to timing and combining these methods. Most of our serious damage to our trees occurs in winter when the voles are running around above ground using the snow as cover. So you don't even know they're there till the snow melts and you see the damage like you see in this picture here. We also have a lot of damage when people's gardens start to mature because they wanna come in and they wanna eat those vegetables as well. So I would say that most of your mitigation needs to occur in the fall if you're trying to protect your trees um, and just and trying to reduce the overall vole population in your yard. Keep that uh, grass mown short before the snow falls. Get the mesh up around your trees. Throughout the year, you need to be removing that border vegetation and keeping your grass low. You can do lethal control year round because basically every new generation can give birth every month. So while they're breeding, you're getting new broods that are then maturing and can quickly turn into a big issue. If you wanna do lethal control, pretty much anytime there's not snow on the ground, you could do lethal control and be successful. So in summary, Damage management can be tricky in backyards and public spaces because you are limited in your lethal control options. You don't wanna put anything out there that's gonna harm the people or the pets that you love. You can use the animal's biology to help you figure out the best way to set up a combination strategy of lethal and non-lethal control tactics. If you have low densities and little damage, Lethal control right at the get-go may work the best with then some vigilance and some monitoring throughout the year to ensure that that population stays low or non-existent. If you have a situation that's gonna be persistent, then you need to consider using methods of non-lethal control in addition to lethal control to help you maintain or maintain a low population and decrease any of the damage. <clears throat> 